y'all would, let's all stand together. Take your Heavenly Highways hymn books and turn over to page number 63. Page 63. Turn over to page number 94. Page 94. Hey, Miss Charlotte. Hey. <laughs> 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 94.
and turn over to page number 250. Page 250. There's a call come ringing o'er the restless waves in the light, in the light. There are souls to there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call to This evening, turn over one page to page number 252. Page 252. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. King's kids are dismissed. Everybody else, if you'll go to Isaiah chapter 66. This will be our last sermon in the series on Isaiah.
Isaiah 66. <clears throat> Whenever you find your place, I'll invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God this evening. Isaiah 66 and verse number 1. It says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you built unto me, and where is the place of my rest? I want to bring our message this evening of wrapping up. Wrapping up. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for this day that you've given us and the opportunity that you allow us to be able to come in in the midweek service to be able to rejoice and sing wonderful praises to you and to be encouraged in your word and to see the truths of it. We thank you, Lord, for this series through Isaiah, for all the truths that you've uh, laid before our eyes and the ways that you've drawn us closer to you through it all. And we just want to praise you for it and, and for giving us a preserved scripture that we can study. Lord, we thank you, God, that you desire to do so much in our midst. And I pray, Father, that we're yielded to you in that. We want to thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <clears throat> so we come to the end of the book of Isaiah, and there's a lot of uh, ending and closing on this chapter and, and prophecy. And whenever we began a long time ago, I think this is like 47 47 weeks of Isaiah. Hey Amen. It's just, it's flown by. It's just flown. But um, uh, whenever we started, remember the book of Isaiah is a, it's a it's kind of a microcosm of the Bible. It's a miniature representation of the whole. And the way that it's laid out, the structure of it, uh, the details behind it, uh, very interesting in the way that that's done. Uh, there's been divisions that we've been able to see of judgment and peace and righteousness and uh, things of that nature. And it's interesting to be able to see the progression of it all, uh, the progression of a people and how he'll take something from the beginning and, and you get to see the beginning and the ending. And, and think about how that is in the Bible, uh, you know, as, as a whole, whenever you look at it and, and creation as a whole. Uh, whenever it started, just think you had two people in a garden. And then at the end of the uh, end of the Bible, you've got this major city of gold, the New Jerusalem that's coming down. You know, it's pretty awesome, and you, you get to see that uh, in uh, the book of Isaiah as well. Throughout the book, uh, there's been a couple of places that have been emphasized and magnified. There's two kingdoms that have been at work. There's a uh, kingdom of light. There's a kingdom of dark, and there's there's that uh, animosity between the two. Uh, there's uh, one major emphasis throughout the book of Isaiah, as well as throughout the Bible, and that emphasis is the throne. Uh, there's that working to get the right person on the throne, and then on the other side you start looking at the people, and there's the working out of the people, the faith that they have, or the lack of faith that they have. In chapter 66 we start to see uh, the end result of faith and the end result of unbelief, and how those things actually uh, play out. Uh, there's plenty of things that, that we just don't understand in this world. Amen. A lot of details and a lot of things we just we really just don't know. And, and some things we think we've got a handle on, and I guarantee you by the time we get to heaven we'll figure out we didn't have a handle on it at all. You know, we were, uh, we, we were pretty prideful or whatever, but we didn't have it as much as we thought. Uh, but one thing that the Lord ensures that we know is the end results of our faith and the end results of unrighteousness as well. He wants us to know uh, what happens. He doesn't leave it open and it's not a choose your own adventure and well let's just see. Uh, we'll find out together. He, he is very clear about what happens uh, whenever a person is living by faith or a person that rejects their faith in the Lord because God wants us to be on the right side. Amen. Uh, he wants that to be uh, defined. And it's a blessing that God allows us to be able to see things from His viewpoint, His perspective. And oftentimes that's, way, uh, that's the way that He works in Scripture. It's kind of like the book of Daniel. We were, uh, you know, at the, uh, at, the, at the conference there. And um, I think, I can't remember, they, they did something else a different day. But, uh, but, you know, I was just thinking about Daniel. We were in chapter 7, and, and whenever you look at it, it's, it's a reflection of chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2 and chapter 7, it's both looking at the Gentile kingdoms that are, that are uh, brought up. Uh, in chapter 2 you're looking at it from man's perspective. Uh, chapter 7 you're looking at it from God's perspective. And you know it's pretty interesting in the Bible that God wants us to be able to see things from His viewpoint. We get, a, we get enough of our own view and our own thoughts and everything. He wants us to be able to know uh, His thoughts on any uh, given matter. Uh, there is coming a day that all false authority, false ideas, they're going to be put down. Amen? And, uh, and all that's going to be left is truth. Um, I was thinking about the second account, remember in the book of Revelation that we've been able to go through, you've got four accounts of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in that. And the second account of the second 
uh, coming of the Lord is in Revelation 11, verse number 15. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voices, uh, there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now remember, this is the that's the perpetual theme throughout the Word of God. There's a battle going on, it's between good and evil. There's a battle over the throne. The day of the Lord is going to come where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be on that throne. He will be ruling. He will be reigning. Amen. So you look in Isaiah 66 and verse number 1 and it says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me and where is the place of my rest? Whenever you know uh, the end of the story, Whenever you're able to know it and look and say, you know what, guess what, we win, amen. Whenever uh, you know the end of it, it gives you a greater appreciation of all the details that are taking place. Uh, you know who's going to win on the end. You, you know uh, that you're on his side. Wonderful. Now then you start looking at some of the details and how it's all going to shake out and what's, what the outcomes are going to be. So we're able to see uh, the differences as we start going through Scripture and we start looking around in our day-to-day -day life. We start seeing that, that picture all around us of things that are true things that are false. And it's amazing to me, especially the closer that we get to that day where the Lord returns, uh, how, how much more um, evident that it is all around us. I mean, you don't have to be a big prophecy scholar to be able to see the things that are going on. I mean, it's just, uh, it is just unfolding right before us and we start seeing those things. Um, one of the things that you see very uh, easily today is that the world has been working to try to throw out God. Amen. Man, that has been the emphasis of the world. Why is that? Well, because Satan is the little G God of this world. Whenever you get to the book of Revelation, which uh, mirrors that chapter 66 of Isaiah, you'll see the reality of what it's like uh, whenever there is not an influence of godliness. Whenever God's people have been raptured out, uh, whenever there's only left with evil on this world, you start seeing the things that are taking place. The Antichrist ri rises up and, and he begins to rule and people think, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and, and, and he's got the authority and, and the might and he begins to rise up and he begins to take over. Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17, it says, he, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Pretty interesting. Uh, that's one of those things everybody wants to know about. And we, of course, we looked at this whenever we went through Revelation. Everybody wants to know, what's the mark? What is the, the mark? That's the big focus of it. You know, we need to back up just a little bit and just say, what's the motivation behind it? What's that motivation? Those who lead the world system at that time, and, and think about this again, it's without God's interference with what it is that they want to do. They're going to lead this world in blasphemy and open rebellion against God. Uh, the main objective of their life is just to blaspheme the Lord. It is open defiance, open rebellion. Uh, as, as much as you could possibly do, that's what's going to be going on without that influence of God. So uh, those that refuse the, the mark and stand for their faith against that religious political system, uh, well, guess what? Uh, well, we say, well, they won't be able to buy and sell. That's true. They're also going to be martyrs. Uh, they're going to have their heads lopped off. Amen. And so uh, that's, that's going on by that restored and revived Roman Empire. So those are the things that are taking place. In those days, um, now consider this for just a minute. It's going to be absolutely impossible for you to take a neutral position. If you were here in that spot and you're looking at the authority of the Antichrist and all that he's doing, or you're going to take the mark or not, there's no deal. It's like, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to do my own thing. There is no neutrality that's going to take place uh, in, that, uh, in that day. There's going to be one authority or another, and you're going to have to make that choice of which one it's going to be. It's amazing knowing that <clears throat> and how quickly it can come upon us. That's where it really stands out whenever you start looking at things of politics today. Because whenever you start thinking about the totalitarianism that, that, that is uh, just kind of amplified, what is that? That means that the government is in control of everything and nobody is, will, and nobody is able to go against what that government has to say. That's what it is. And that's what's actually been promoted. And you start seeing it uh, showing up in all different areas of life. And it's been doing this for a long time. You know, it's, it's always working toward that end. 
and, and I promise we'll get to the scriptures here in a minute, but, but just kind of stick with me. Uh, but, but whenever you start seeing uh, what's happening with that, think about labor unions. So what does that have to do with anything? Uh, you know, it's, it's about that mindset, isn't it? It's about that mindset. Uh, labor unions started out in the right manner. It started out for the right cause. Uh, whenever you look at it, man, people were just, it was horrible work conditions, all this kind of stuff. The labor unions were established saying, look, uh, you can't just trample over your employees. You know, it, it was a matter of we, our employees need some rights and all that kind of thing. And, and it started out as a, as a good thing. But over time, it, it turned into this system. And it was a system of governing a work environment that actually stifled the productivity. It was actually something that said, uh, you know, uh, before, uh, if you're in a non-union type work, well, you know what happens? You do good work. Uh, you, you excel in something. What happens? Well, you get promoted. Uh, you actually set a higher bar. You probably get a different reward. Hey, here's somebody. They just saved me a lot of money. I'm going to give them some money. You know, uh, it's pass on. You're going to be the new supervisor. We're going to make a position for you. Those are the things that happen. But whenever there's a, a labor union, then there's a bar that's set and said, okay, here's the job. Here's the responsibility. You don't do any more. You don't do any less. This is just what it is. Now, what is the, the bar that's set? It's at the low rung, not the high rung. They don't say, listen, guys, we want you to excel. They say, no, no, just get, just get by. And it, it actually lowers the productivity. Now, what happens is, is that whenever you're in that, then all of a sudden, <clears throat> there's going to be a strike. And you see this all the time. Be, well, you know, so-and-so striking all this, you know. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you, you work at the factory, and your family depends upon your check. You're having to feed your kids. But they said, no, 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 you can't go to work. What do you mean I can't go to work? I, I mean, I, I, y'all, y'all strike if you want to, but, but I need a check. I need to be able to work. I need to be able to provide for my family. You can't do that. Now, all of a sudden... The individual rights are not there anymore. It's the system. That system has the controlling authority. And if you are going beyond that system, well, guess what? You are now the enemy. The, the individuality of labor has been removed and the power has been designated to that system. The system determines what a person can attain. Meanwhile, people join those labor uh, unions, and, and, and they're told, man, you're foolish if you don't do that. Don't you know that you, you get more money for that? No, no. Isn't that amazing? People say, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll sacrifice who I am as a person and what I can actually accomplish so that maybe I can get more money because all I've got to do is meet the lowest possible rung anyway. That's what they kind of thrive on. If you've got a, if you've got, this is separate, if you've got a lazy work attitude, you should be rewarded for your lazy work attitude. Uh, it shouldn't be a matter of saying, well, I'm going to get a better paying job without doing as much. Shame on you. That's a horrible Christian outlook. I understand that for the lost world, but not for somebody that's saved. You should be giving your best. Whatsoever that hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Amen. should be that, that's your mode of work. Anyway, recently we just saw that same kind of a push, that same kind of a totalitarian effort through health care. You know, it's pretty interesting how easy that was. And you'll, you'll see this all throughout. You back up and you start looking at different ways. You just start looking at, you know, how can the government get a little bit more control? Ronald Reagan talked about it years ago. I remember that. He said, whenever, uh, whenever government wants to be able to take over, they always start with health care. It's always presented as something that's going to be beneficial for you. And then they want you to depend upon them. You know, it was just a couple of years ago, it was determined, well, if you don't have your card and you don't have, you know, your 12 boosters or whatever, you can't fly, uh, you can't go in the store, you can't do this and that. And it was that attempt to, to push and just to try to establish what it is that you can and what you cannot do. The system tells you what it is that you need to do and you just need to like it. And if you don't, then all of a sudden you become the public enemy because you didn't go along with the system. Man, that's all right around us. It's amazing how that, you know, and, and I'm not telling you what to do. I don't, I don't care. I'm telling you, look around and see what's happening. Look around and notice the, that totalitarian yeah. effort and that push that's going about. And it's not just uh, political. It's not just health care. It can fall into the religious realm as well. You know, the trend in, in churches, religion, has been to have an, an ecclesiastical rule of one body over multiple churches. 
that's been the pattern for a number of years. So much th so that we're, we are uh, heritage, we are an independent Baptist church. We don't have that hierarchy. We don't have an authority. We don't have a, a uh, convention that's over us and says, okay, this is what, what it is that we're going to teach. The Bible says that Jesus is the head of the church. Our authority is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But over time, uh, it's amazing how uh, it's, it's deemed as the most socially acceptable thing that you can do is to have some kind of a centralized union that's going to dictate the way that uh, uh, the other assemblies are going to gather and what they're going to do and all that type of thing. That type of hierarchy is completely unscriptural. The whole principle of New Testament Christianity is that a local church is independent, autonomous, body believers that answers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, you say, well, what about fellowships? Fellowships are fine. Amen. Hey, you, can, you, can, you can be cooperative with, with whatever you as a church elect to do. But no church has the authority to be able to dictate what your operation and things are supposed to be. Amen. Now why would that idea catch on in churches whenever it's not in the Bible? And it's not even in, in practice, it's not in terminology, and it's not just one denomination, it's not just Southern Baptist Convention or United Methodist or Roman Catholic. I mean, it's just one of those things that prevails. Why does that actually happen? You know, I think a lot of it has to do with that push for power. It's the authority. I remember, I'll leave them unnamed, but there was a certain convention uh, that was, had their missionaries going, going abroad, and, and they dropped their doctrinal stands. They actually said that it was okay for their missionaries to speak in tongues. Completely unbiblical. Completely unbiblical. The convention said that they believed that it was unbiblical, but their missionaries were going to be allowed to do that. And then it said it in the report because the charismatic groups that were overseas were getting more people than they were. You know, somebody should have stood up there and said, what? You, you mean to tell me that we're going to change the whole doctrinal practice of how we honor the Word of God based on whether another group gets more people? But that's oftentimes the motivating factor whenever it starts looking at hierarchies. See, whenever we start thinking about a local assembly, uh, there's none of our ministries that are accomplished or that are done because of another church and what it is that that other church does. Uh, we don't look and say, okay, well, uh, we've got to have X number of people because this church has this n number of people. No, we're supposed to be stewards for everybody that God delivers through the doors of this church. We're supposed to be edifying, building up, and growing, and uh, being the spiritual leaders that we are supposed to be. Whenever we follow the wrong map model, we start falling into that same trap that has been playing out since Adam fell. And that's the battle that the Israelites have been facing all through Isaiah. Whenever you start thinking about the book of Isaiah and what was taking place, the Israelites are always facing that dilemma of whether or not they will be their own God or whether God will be their God. That's how it is. And it's just back and forth, and that's what we've been able to see throughout all this time. So uh, if they're going to follow God, if they're going to rebel against God, and then we get to chapter number 65. Chapter 65, there's, through that chapter there's this sifting that's taking place. Whenever you sift something, what are you doing? Uh, you, you're, you're shuffling out junk. Stuff that shouldn't be there. Some kind of a characteristic. Uh, there's going to be one distinguishing characteristic. Maybe it's a particle size or something. You know, you sift and, it, and things kind of start falling out. And uh, those are the things that are being exposed. Uh, the, whenever you start looking at chapter 65, whenever you start seeing the sifting that's going on, what's being sifted? The false and the true. You're looking at something that is false and it says, all right, uh, that's going to be all piled up together. You're going to be able to notice the things that are false and you're going to be able to notice those things that are true. And God has results for both the rebellious and the faithful through that sifting. So Isaiah, uh, if you remember from our last time, Isaiah uh, had this prayer in uh, chapter 64, verse number 1. He says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, and so on. Remember, that was his prayer. He says, God, just come on, man. Uh, if you will just come on, this would be great. Well, whenever you get to chapter 65, you've got the response 
of God to be able to assure Isaiah and the remnant that were still faithful, those that were still true to God, that he knows exactly what true and false is. He's going to be coming in his timing. He's going to know exactly what to do, and he's got the remedy for both the faithful and the unfaithful. See, God is not fooled uh, by anything. He's not fooled by unfaithfulness. Uh, he's not fooled by hypocrisy or false worship or rebellion or idolatry. Uh, and this is what you start to, to see. In chapter 65, and look at it in verse number 2. 65 verse 2 he says, I, spread, uh, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of bricks, which remain among the graves, and lodge in the mountain, uh, monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and a broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Isn't that amazing? He says, Listen, uh, Isaiah's praying. He says, Lord, just come on. If you'll just come, everything will be right. And he says, Look, uh, I know what's going on. He said, I have been opening my hands to a rebellious people who are saying, we are holier than you. And he said, and all the while, he said, they're eat up with idolatry. They've got all these abominable things all through their life. That's what they're getting eat up with. And he says, but I'm, I'm giving them that opportunity. But he's telling Isaiah, he says, listen, don't worry. God is going to take care of business. It's going to be all right. Uh, keep going in verse number five. It says, you start seeing there's a judgment that's here. He says, uh, there are, uh, these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense unto their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. He says, there will be a judgment on rebellion. And then he starts giving the reasons. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't, short, he just, he doesn't just say, well, you know, uh, they were just rebellious. No, he, he goes through and actually describes it exactly what was going on. Look at it in verse number 11. <clears throat> he says, but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, and prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because, now here's the reason. He says, these are the reasons that judgment is going to come. When I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. But did evil before mine eyes, now watch this, this is big, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. They chose evil over God. He says, he says, I was calling. He said, you wouldn't answer. I was showing you truth and you wouldn't respond to it. And he said, in all the way, he said, you made the choice. There's always a choice. Every person is going to choose the direction that they're going to go. There's always a choice. You can choose God or you can choose to rebel against God, but that choice belongs to you. But don't think that that choice does not have consequences for the good and the bad. There's different rewards for, for the rebellious. There's different rewards for the faithful. Look at what he says, verse 13. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. The purpose of the, the sifting, whenever you start thinking about it, okay, he's sifting, he's showing what's false, he's showing what's true, he's showing what's faithful or what's unfaithful. It's not just a matter of saying, all right, judgment time, here we go. Uh, he's not just judging for the sake of judging. Amen? What's the purpose? Well, as he's coming up, there's about to be this whole establishment of a, of a new order. Man, you, you see uh, uh, government talking about it today. Well, it's a new world order. Bring it on, buddy, because that means we are out of here. Amen. But, but this is God's order. This is God's establishment. He says, I've got a plan here. Look at what he says in verse 17. He says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. This is where there's that wiping away of tears that we just saw over uh, in the book of Revelation last time. So at the center of that new order, so far as the earth is concerned, what's going to take place? Well, there's going to be a new city, 
And uh, that new city of God is Jer that new Jerusalem. There's going to be a city and a people that are characterized by joy. That's what he, he refers to them is, is about the, the joy to God, uh, the, the rejoicing in their spirit, all that time of weeping and mourning. It's all over. Life's going to be completely different. The unjust things that we know today, they're going to be past. All of a sudden that place, whenever you start reading, it's pretty interesting because the two things that are so characteristic, it, it's joy and fellowship with God. Joy and fellowship with God. The two go hand in hand. You know, we already get to know that to a small degree, a very small degree right now. Uh, you, you know what it's like whenever you have a good intimate fellowship with the Lord. You know that there is a joy that is in your heart whenever, it, sometimes it's a prayer time, sometimes it's a preaching service, man, and God just kind of gets all in you, amen. Uh, he, he's, just, he's just working on you, and you know, it's the expression, He squeezes your heart till the, till the juice comes out your eyes kind of thing. You know, there's just that, uh, there's something about it, it's like, man, that was just, it was just powerful. Sometimes you're just reading it in the Scripture, and things start clicking. And all of a sudden, it's a revelation and an Isaiah and a, and a Sunday school, and it all comes together, and you say, here it is! And it may not be some. You, you try to tell somebody, and they say, yeah, that's good. Yeah. You know, but it was for you. Amen? God showed you something about that. There's something about that at that point. Man, you've got a real fellowship with God. You know something about the heart of God, and there is a rejoicing in your spirit for the things of God. You know, it can go away and middle of the afternoon. Heaven won't be like that. It'll just be continual. Amen. That fellowship never gets old. It never darkens. It never fades. It's just rejoicing. And that's what he's describing. Life is going to be completely different. So that brings up the final message in chapter 66. And what's taking place in chapter 66, he's, he's kind of closing things out, and there's really, uh, it's a last word to three different parts. So there's a last word to the formalists in the first four verses. There's a last word to his remnant, and then there's a last word that he has to the rest of the world. And that's how it is that he closes out here in chapter number 66. And God has, has dealt with these things throughout uh, the book of Isaiah and as well as the rest of the Bible. But here it's like he's just kind of wrapping up and he says, hey, let me give you the final report. Whenever you're in school, remember you'd have to write your, your, uh, your term paper, your theme paper, whatever it was. And, and you know, you got your introduction, then you got your body. And then at the conclusion, you're going to restate the things. And here's the, here's the things that you have to remember that you want people to to come away with, because they're going to forget everything else. But here's the last thing I want you to get, and that's what God is putting in chapter 66. First off, he's got the message here to the formalists. Now, who is that? That's the religionists. Very religious, but uh, not honoring God. So chapter 66, <clears throat> verse number 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He says, all these things, he said, man, I understand the foundation of it, the building of it and everything, but he said, the thing I'm looking for, you know, it's the meek. Remember Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Remember that? There is, he's looking for, what is that meekness? It's power under control. It's recognizing God's authority. It's not weakness. It's not mild mannered. It's, it's, it's accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish because that is his desire and he is the authority of your life. Verse number three, he says, he that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, and he that sacrificeth the lamb, as if he cut off a, a, a dog's neck, and he that offereth an oblation, as if he offered swine's blood, and he that burneth incense, as if he blessed an idol, yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. He says, I've got a way. They chose their own way, and they're delighting in this idolatry, these abominations that are taking place. Verse 4, it says, and I also will choose their uh, will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. It's the exact same thing that he just said in, in 65. He says, I called, they wouldn't answer. I tried to speak to them, they didn't want to hear it. They made the choice to rebel against me. Now these were, uh, they, were uh, they were proud of doing things their own way. 
These are the religionists. They were doing religious things, but they, it was all about themselves. It was all doing their own type of interest, their own desire, their own way. It wasn't about God. Now, what does that mean? Whenever you're doing something, it doesn't matter if it's religious or not. Whenever you're doing something your way instead of God's way, it is idolatry. Idolatry is anything that, that comes between you and God. It's anything that's, that's going to be man-made, man-centered instead of God-established. So whenever, even if they're worshiping per se, even if they're doing religious things, but they're doing it their way instead of God's way, he says, man, that's, that's an abomination. He said, that is idolatry. It brings about four pictures that he mentions in verse number three. There's four, th four things that he says, these are things that, that they were doing. He talks about killing an ox, sacrifice of a lamb, offering an oblation, and burning incense. Those four things right there, that's the first part. He says, he says, it's this as this, this as this. The first part of those four entries there, those are things that they were doing. Killing an ox, sacrifice of a lamb, offering oblation, burning incense. Those were all things that were established and expected in the Old Testament sacrifices. Those were all things that, that you would look at and say, well, that, that's what they're supposed to be doing. That's what God commanded them to do. And he says, listen, you guys have been doing that. But instead, he says, but the heart of the matter, he says, it's all been because of you, not because of me. And whenever that's the case, whenever their heart is, has been set on honoring themselves instead of honoring God, that brings up the second thing that you see there in verse number three. He says, you, you start off as you're killing an ox, but he says, it's as the slaying of a man. And so you start looking at the second things that are listed in verse three there. He says, because of those practices that are just idolatry, he said, it's like the slaying of a man, breaking a dog's neck, offering swine's blood, blessing an idol. He said, all of those things that you're doing, you were looking at them thinking that they were religious, but whenever you were doing it for you and not for me, he said, the things that are there, you would look at and say, that's an absolute abomination. It's amazing whenever you compare those two, whenever you're thinking about the ox and the lamb, the oblation, the incense, you're like, oh man, those are good. Those are good spiritual things they were supposed to be doing. But you look at the other pattern, you're like, well, you know, killing a guy, uh, breaking a dog's neck, offering some swine's blood and blessing an idol. You look at that and you're like, that's horrible. Man, that is just so pagan. What made the difference? What made the difference was they were seeking their own direction and their own interest instead of God's. That was it. So verse 3, he says, Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. He said, all of this is going on, and he said, this, it's a pleasure for them. This is the joy of their day in the things that are going on. False worship <clears throat> takes what's good and corrupts it because there's a disloyalty of the heart toward God. And that's why God disapproved of all their ceremonies. Remember back in chapter 1, go back there real quick, where we started. Way back where we started, chapter 1. He brings it up way back then. Verse number 13, he says, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meetings, your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I'm, I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make uh, many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Remember, we looked at that and we're like, man, oh, What's so bad? I mean, they're doing religious things. They're making offerings. They're praying. They thought, man, they got a great song service. It's great. But what was God doing? Man looks on the outward appearance. God's looking on the heart. And God says, your heart is not for me. Your heart is for doing things of yourself. And he said, the, the things that I'm seeing are that abomination, that idolatry. He says, it's like you're slaying people and, 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 and sharing uh, swine's blood and blessing idols. He said, that's what I see. That's why he says, put it away from me. I don't want to have anything else to do with it. And he finally gets to the point where he's, where he's done. He started off in verse number 1 of 66, and he says, heaven is his throne, and earth is his footstool. And, and notice what he says here. He says, where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? You know, it's interesting. No, no one place of worship could possibly contain all of the holiness of God. Amen? Right. No way it, it ever could. The whole earth is supposed to be a sacred place. 
That's what God established it to be. And that really explains a lot. Uh, religion seeks to put, man, or put God in a box. Is this all right? Uh, God is going to be God in, in this place. That's what religion does. Religion tries to make uh, the establishment of a place, the whole, uh, a holy place, talking about, you know, a church house. Oh, well, this, this is a holy place. I've said it. You've heard it a million times across the world over. Well, I don't know why we've got to lock the doors anymore. We used to have it open where people could come in and pray. Not anymore. This used to be a holy place. Not anymore. Can I tell you, the rest of the world is supposed to be a holy place too. God established this earth to be a sacred, holy place. That's what it is that He desired. What changed? Man stopped seeking God. Man stopped having God as the authority. Who did that? Adam. And it's been on a decline ever since. Look what he says. <clears throat> um, he turns his attention to the remnant. So he's looked at the religionists. Now he's going to look at the, the remnant here. And these are those who have been faithful and true to God. So verse number 5 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at His word. So that's a good thing. I mean, trembling at the word of God, that's, that's good. He says, here's what I'm, who I'm speaking to, and this is what, what I want you to do. I want you to hear. He says, Your brethren that hated you and cast you out for my name's sake said, Let the Lord be glorified. But he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. It's pretty interesting. It makes me think of Joseph whenever I read that. It's what his brothers did. You know, he's got that coat and everything. Oh, boy, he's well favored. And now he, he, gets, he gets cast out. He says, your brothers cast you out. They had been persecuted, but they would be comforted. Those that persecuted them would be ashamed. He says in verse number 6, he says, A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. That, that voice is God's voice. God's voice rendereth recompense. What does that mean? It means he gives exactly what they deserve. He's going to render that recompense. Uh, those who are faithful are going to be comforted. And we'll be rejoicing. Look at it in verse number 13. Verse 13, it says, <clears throat> As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. And you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. Lastly, there's the parting words to the world. The parting words to the world, and, and this will go from verse 15 on through the end of the, the chapter. It's kind of like he's, he's wrapping this thing up, and he says, all right, uh, everybody else, he says, this is what it is that's going on. Here's the judgments. Here's the people. Here's the rebellion. Here's the stuff. He said, if you're having a tough time deciding who it is that you are actually going to serve, let me go ahead and lay it down for you like this, and this is what he's going to end out with. So let's look at it. Verse number 15. He says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with His chariots like a whirlwind, to render His anger with fury, and His rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by His sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and all the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse. He's talking about, uh, listen, there's people that are eating unclean pigs and rodents. Amen? That's what, he's, what it, the picture is. He says, it shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Verse 18, he says, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come, that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pud, Lud, and draw to the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that, uh, that have not uh, heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the uh, out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And I will Take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. Pretty interesting. That's one of those things whenever we, uh, kind of side note here. 
But remember, uh, we were just talking about this in, in Revelation. People think, well, you know, as, as long as, as soon as every, every person has had the opportunity to hear the gospel, the Lord's going to come back. No, no. Uh, everybody will hear the, all those nations, tongues, and languages will hear, but it'll be after the church is raptured out. That's going to be the, the mission of that 144,000. That's what he's talking about there uh, in verse number 19 and 20. Anyway, uh, verse number 22, it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth will I make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Remember we saw this before. Uh, there's that reverting back to that Old Testament style of worship during the millennial reign. Verse 24 says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. He said, hell is going to be eternal. There is not an, an annihilation of the soul or of the, the people that are there. Uh, whenever they are in hell, it's going to be continual. It's going to be persistent. They will never get used to it. Now, I love this. As you go through, I encourage you to just kind of circle the I wills and they shalls. It's, uh, he says over and over, I will and they shall. There's no guesswork taking place. The new heavens, the new earth, he says, verse number 22, he says, they will remain. And so will the people who fear God and serve Him. And those that rebel against God are going to be past hope. So as he said in Isaiah 57, 21, it says, there is no peace to the wicked. And that's certainly true. For us today, our responsibility is to ensure that every person knows the gospel. Every person has the opportunity to choose for themselves whether or not they're going to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's the great commission of the church. You can't force somebody to be saved, but you can make sure that every person within your ability is going to get to hear the gospel. Amen. That's what we should be focusing on. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the grace that you extend. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Isaiah and for the time that we've been able to study through it. Thank you for the reminders that you give us that are so uh, needed uh, right now, Lord, and how much this speaks to us in the, the day and the hour that we're in. Help us to be effective witnesses, to see the things that are uh, taking place around us, Lord, and to be able to honor you in the way that it all comes about. Lord, help us to put you first in all things. And, and uh, Lord, if there's anything that's standing in our way, something, some besetting sin, something that shouldn't be there, help us, Lord, to be able to get that uh, reconciled and rectified, Lord, so that we can uh, be a vessel of honor for your use, recognizing the time that is at hand. And we just want to thank you for it. I pray, God, that you'd watch over us as we depart from this place. Help us, Lord, to uh, continue to think on these things and see us safely back the next appointed time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are dismissed.